It's more challenging than others. This happens to be one of them. And uh, trust that you will just open your heart as Pastor Alex comes. And uh, I'm going to pray for him this morning. This will be his first shot of uh, preaching. And uh, probably nervous as I get up here anyway. Nervous. But the opportunity for him to share the Word of God. Uh, next week will be the last sermon on the Gospels in Harmony series that we have now established and we'll be finishing up and we'll have the Lord's table next week and uh, trust you will prepare your heart for that. But today, we're going to learn about Barabbas. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son. And Lord, what a tragic end to his physical life upon earth it was. Father, today we want to keep our focus upon Jesus Christ as we consider the life of Barabbas and what happened to him and what happened to the Lord. Father, we pray for Pastor Alex that you would use him in a very special way to minister to us, help us to listen, to learn, and more importantly, to apply the word of God to our hearts. Glorify yourself in these moments, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we continue to worship the Lord this morning with, I hope and trust, open hearts and open minds, um, just take a second to meditate on what we just sang. Um, I love those, those songs. Um, he took the fall, right? He took... The scourging, imagine that. Whipping after whip after whip. He took the nails in his hands and feet. He took the mocking, the ridiculing, the crown of thorns. And thought of you and thought of me that entire time. If that is not love, I don't know what love is. Amen. Amen. I like that video that, that we uh, watched to open our service this morning because the scripture doesn't tell us really if Barabbas responded or not to that pivotal moment in his life, right? I mean, he was this close to being between those two criminals on the cross and not Jesus Christ. But he was spared, even though, we'll talk about that, even though he deserved that punishment, he was spared. And so, yeah, he may have felt remorse, he may have felt guilt, we don't know, but it's something to think about. If, if you had been in Barabbas' place, how would you have responded to this Jesus of Nazareth taking your place on the tree? If you have your Bibles, I hope and trust that you do. Uh, our chief text this morning in the Gospels will be Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, verses 15 through 21. Matthew 27, 15 through 21. The ESV text reads, now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. We 
We know from the text, right from the text, God's word, it says that Barabbas was a notorious prisoner. And in the, in the text here, notorious means that he was bearing a mark and he was notable or infamous, if you will. We know that uh, from studying the text and the surrounding context and scholars would say that he was an insurrectionist and a murderer. Uh, Mark, Luke, and John uh, have other adjectives for him as well, but he was a notorious prisoner, this Barabbas. He was an insurrectionist, and he was proven guilty of murder. He was a rebel and a robber, and again, he was proven guilty. That's the background of Barabbas, okay? We have Barabbas, and you have Jesus. That's Barabbas. Then we have Jesus Christ, right, on the other side. In John 18, as Pastor Les uh, taught us through last week, he said his kingdom is not of this world. And that was proven true, right? Jesus Christ, he was born to be a king, right? John 18, 37. Again, he bears witness to the truth. And also, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. It's pretty, quite a big contrast there, isn't it? Barabbas was proven guilty of his crimes. He was known. There was no way he could plead his case. Boom, case closed. Jesus Christ, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. This morning, our focus in this chief text of, our, of the Harmony in the Gospels today is that there are two results in a decision to reject Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. There are two results, and we'll talk about both of those this morning. The first result, there are consequences. Okay, when you actively choose, because you have a choice, okay? God doesn't force you one way or the other. When you choose to reject Jesus Christ, there are consequences. Well, what consequences? First, let's talk a little bit about the Jews' motivation behind their choice of Barabbas. Why, if it was such a, you know, quite a big contrast, why would they choose Barabbas, right? It's a very valid question. Well, we know from verse 18 of Matthew 27, Pilate even knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered Jesus up to him. And also for the chief priests and the elders, of the Jewish leadership. They were trying to fulfill their wicked agenda, right? Let's talk a little bit about that, out of envy. Well, what is envy? Envy is a particularly strong feeling of resentment, right? Another definition is that it is synonymous with jealousy, okay? You, you or, you know, the Ten Commandments, do not covet right? Well, do not envy, do not be jealous. You see, it was out of envy, it was out of jealousy, it was out of covetousness that the Jews desired to kill Jesus Christ, their Messiah, that they didn't recognize. Next week, Pastor Lest will go into more detail uh, a little bit further down in chapter 27. But I want to look briefly with, there, with you to kind of see how corrupted and how, how far gone the Jewish leaders were at this time. In Matthew 27, verses 24 and 25, the text tells us, So when Pilate saw that he was ga gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Wow. His blood be on us and on our children. That's a very prophetic statement that they probably didn't realize in that moment. But think about that. They were so envious. They hated to the core this Jesus Christ of Nazareth that they said, We don't care. We'll take full responsibility, full accountability, crucify him. That's all we want. We'll take the blame. 
It's powerful stuff. This word envy uh, in the Greek, this word envy um, is also used in Galatians 5.21, this form of envy, this definition. And in Galatians 5.21, it says, the flesh produces envy, drunkenness, orgies. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this is not a matter of you can lose your salvation, okay? Those who are saved have an eternal position in Christ. We're not talking about that this morning. The Jewish leaders, those who were in the crowd that were envious of Jesus Christ, were not saved. They rejected the Messiah, and because of that, they didn't inherit the kingdom of God, right? Because they rejected Jesus Christ. And we too have a choice today that if we also reject Jesus Christ, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? Romans 1.29, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit. That's the Apostle Paul there again. And he's talking about the the unrighteous, right? The unrighteous are envious. They're evil to the core. I wanted to look deeper into Matthew 27, 20. It says that the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. They persuaded the crowd. What does that mean? That couldn't have been an easy task. Well, the word persuade here in this context means obviously to persuade, but it's with the intention of fulfilling wrong motives or resolves, right? Because you can persuade someone to exercise. You can persuade someone to eat healthy. You can persuade someone to come to church with you. That's a good thing. But their persuasion was solely for their own wicked agenda, their envy, and their evil desires, okay? And this also, this word persuade, to give you some uh, and a better understanding, is in Matthew 28, 14. And interestingly, it's of the same exact group of people, the Jewish leaders. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. If you don't know this, the context of this statement, it's after Jesus was crucified, buried, and then he rose again, right? And Pilate, or the Roman officials, had put Roman guards to, to guard his tomb. But the tomb was empty, right? And that was their charge. With the Jewish elders trying to continue on that path of destruction and wickedness and evil plotting, they said, they paid off the guards and they said, don't worry. We will win him over and keep you out of trouble. We will persuade him to keep you out of trouble. Keep your finger in Matthew 27, but turn with me to Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22, if you will. This is the story of the rich young ruler, right? I'm sure you may be familiar with this passage. Mark 10, verses 17 through 22. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him, Jesus, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack but one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. You see, the rich young ruler thought that it was just checking off every day. Okay, didn't commit adultery, didn't defraud. I called my mom and my my dad and I honored them today, right? He thought that was the extent of his faith. And it wasn't, right? 
But Jesus, looking at him, knowing that he was missing something, instead of judging him, instead of correcting him, hitting him with a ruler and saying, no, kid, this is the truth. He looked at him, and he loved him. And he said, there's one more thing I have for you. Go sell everything you have. And that's, that was a big task for him because it says he's a rich young man. We don't know if he was a, um, you know, a, a doctor or a, a lawyer of sorts or an um, entrepreneur. We don't know his background, but we know he was very wealthy and, and well off, right? Go sell all of that to the poor and come follow me. What does the text say after that? How did he respond? Well, the text says that the man was disheartened by the saying. He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You see, beloved, greed is synonymous with and can lead to envy. Now, some may say, oh, the rich young man wasn't greedy. He just loved what he had. Well, if you love money and its pursuit, in my book, that's greed. And greed will very well lead to envy. The text said that the man went away disheartened. Well, disheartened simply means to be distressed or have great sorrow in one's heart. And the same word disheartened is found in Matthew 26, 22, just a chapter over from our chief text. And it says, and they, the disciples, were very sorrowful. You see, Matthew 26, 22 is when Jesus tells them at the Lord's Supper that someone is going to betray him that evening. Someone is going to betray him and lead him over to be killed, right? And he, upon hearing this, the disciples were very sorrowful within themselves. They were disheartened to the core. And they began to say to him, to Jesus, one after another, is it I, Lord? You see, they couldn't imagine this teacher who they had been following, who they, who they stole all their possessions and followed him, right, for the past three years. He told them, one of you in this room is going to leave, betray me, and have me crucified. And they said, what? Surely not I, Lord. And also in John 16.6, but because I, this is Jesus speaking, have said these things, sorrow has filled your heart. See, in John 16, the context of that is that he's saying to them, to the disciples, that I am about to leave you and to go back to my Father. But don't worry. It is to your advantage that I go, and I will send a helper, a comforter, right, the Holy Spirit, to be with you. And in that, same, in, in that same event, the disciples felt sorrow. They were disheartened in their heart. This is the way, this is how the rich young ruler felt when he was told to sell all that he had. It's incredible. And unfortunately, friends, that you too will feel sorrow you will feel extreme sorrow as the disciples and as the rich young ruler did someday if you reject Jesus Christ. You see, you may have chosen to believe in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, and have received salvation, which is different from the Jews, the Jewish leaders in Matthew 27. However, that is not the only time you will come to a crossroads where you have to choose between the world and Jesus Christ. You, will never, you may never know when the next time is going to happen, but you will come to a crossroads where you have Jesus Christ and his word, the truth, which we talked about last week, right? And then you will have the desires of the flesh. You will have the world, all of that on the other side. What will you choose? And it's easy to say the world, sin, you know, sinful desires, but I can make it very real for you maybe a promotion, maybe moving away to a different city, maybe bu buying another car. You see, some of those, those things in themselves are not bad, right? It's not bad to get a new car. It's not bad to have a promotion. That's success. 
But anything that you put higher than Jesus Christ becomes an idol. And in so doing, you're choosing those things over Jesus Christ. You see, envy, as it did the Jewish leaders, it affects your overall health. Because you see, envy affects your physical health, it affects your emotional health, and it also affects your spiritual well-being. And it's interesting because the secular definition of overall health is being healthy in all those three areas. So if you're lacking physically, or if your emotional health is subpar, or maybe just your spiritual health, you're not fully healthy because you're lacking one of those areas. Envy also leads to destruction and remorse, right? The Jews, they, they didn't know it in that scene when they were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. We want Barabbas. We don't want nothing to do with you. They didn't know in that moment that they were leading to their own destruction, but we know that they did because they rejected Jesus Christ who was their Messiah, who they had been waiting for for generations and generations. And because they rejected him, they did not inherit the kingdom of God. And God will put them aside for over 2,000 years because they're still temporarily set aside right now and God is not working with the nation of Israel right now, right? And envy ultimately will lead to estrangement or separation from God. And I mentioned that just now with the nation of Israel. But if you choose a path of envy, if you feel envy in your heart and you act on it, that sin that you're committing will separate you, even if you're saved, it'll separate you from your fellowship with Jesus Christ. You have the relationship, because you may have that position of salvation, right? That positional that position in Christ, but even though you're saved, when you're living in a habitual sin, like say envy here, you're not having that fellowship with God. And that will do a big number on your spiritual well-being. So there are two results in a decision to reject Jesus Christ. The first result we talked about is that there will be consequences, right? The Jews consequences were too many to bear. Well, it doesn't get much better. <laughs> the second result is that the flesh will take control. When you reject Jesus Christ, the flesh will take you over. First, it will take over your heart. Job 36, 13 says, the godless in heart, cherish anger. They do not cry for help. Hmm. The godless in heart cherish anger. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. This is kind of a doozy here. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes. Do these the rest of this list sound familiar to you? A lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, a false witness who breathes out lies. You see, I highlighted those in red because the Jewish leaders in that crowd were guilty of all those things. Almost all of the things that the writer in Proverbs there says, God hates. You see, when you re openly reject Jesus Christ, your heart is the first to go. And you see, the scripture also tells us that guard your heart. Why should we guard our heart? Because from it flows the springs of life. Interesting. You see, the Jews were in this, the Jewish leaders were in this downward spiral, you see. This wasn't the first moment here in this scene in Matthew 27 that they were envious of Jesus. No, you see, Throughout Jesus' entire ministry, the Jewish leaders and scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, were envious of Jesus. And we're going to talk more about that in a second here. Secondly, after the flesh takes control of your heart, it'll take control of your mind. Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 11. 
John chapter 11, starting in verse 45. And what we're reading here, the context of John eleven forty five 45 through 51 is prior to the events uh, of having to choose between Barabbas and Jesus. Okay, to give you some context here. John 11, starting in verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come, take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. It is better for you that one man should die for the people than have the whole nation perish. Hmm. Does that ring a bell to you? Who that one man is? Jesus Christ. You see, going back to verse 48, I don't have it up there. Going back to verse 48, the text tells us that because of their fear of Rome, right, being taken over by Rome, their own personal comforts and position, right, oh, the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. They will take our positions away. We'll have no more authority over the people and they'll take our nation as well. You see, out of, because of their fear, because of their love and desire for their status and their comfort, their mind was being corrupted because of these things. And this is where the downward spiral began. See, Caiaphas knew about the coming Messiah. He knew there was a man who would come. But you see, if you go back to the triumphal entry scene, they were hoping for, they were looking for a conquering hero, someone who would overthrow the Roman um, rule and free the nation of Israel to be their own nation, right? And that's why they loved Barabbas. Because you see, Barabbas was a Robin Hood-type figure to them. He, you know, who's Robin Hood? He stole from the rich to give to the poor, right, to help the people because of a corrupt King John. Well, that's how they viewed Barabbas because he was, he was trying to overthrow Roman soldiers. He was trying to free the people, free them from the oppression of Rome, and that's how they viewed Barabbas. So that was very attractive to them because he was doing some of the things they thought their coming Messiah was going to do. So naturally, they clung they were drawn to him. And also, uh, we don't know for sure, but many scholars think that Barabbas was a part of the group, the Zealots, or the Zealots. And you see, the Zealots were were a group uh, of Jews who were, because they were so zealous for the Lord in their mind, they actively took up the sword against the Roman oppression. And so because of that, because Barabbas may have been in that group, he had this deep burning, this emotional zeal to overthrow Rome in that area and there in Jerusalem. So we know that the flesh, when you choose to reject Jesus Christ, your heart is gone. Your mind, it's gone. And that's bad enough, right? But that's not the end. It keeps going. After your heart and your mind, your eternal destiny. Now again, as I said, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying you can lose your salvation. But in the text here, of going back to Matthew 27, in this specific story of the Gospels, of Jesus' life, the end of his life, the Jews 
lost their eternal destiny in terms of the kingdom of God because they rejected the Messiah. They rejected Jesus Christ. If you have not come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and God's word tells us that he doesn't desire anyone, God doesn't want anyone to die, but that everyone may come to a knowledge of the truth. He doesn't want your eternal destiny to be in hell, eternally separated from him. But he gives us the choice. Because, you know, he could have created robots to, to worship him, right? We could all be robots and we all just praise God, worship him, we follow all the commandments, right? But is that genuine love? Is that genuine worship to the Almighty God? No, because he would have programmed us to be that way. So you have a choice. Your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers have a choice. Do you know what choice they've made? Because if they're choosing right now, no, they may not be as vehemently rejecting Jesus Christ as the Jews were, but every day that they're not saved is a day that they wake up and they reject Jesus Christ, whether they know it or they don't. But you see, beloved, you know this decision that's hanging over everyone's head in this life, right? You know that decision that people have to make. If you have made the right decision, I hope and I pray that you will help those you know and that you love to make that decision as well. And it may take years. It may take the rest of your life. You may never know what decision they come to, but are you praying for them? Are you loving on them? Are you serving them? Are you being a, a living, walking, breathing example of Jesus Christ? Because you see, Paul tells us that you are ambassadors for Jesus Christ, as though God is talking about himself through you, right? You know what, what ambassador is. So because you are an ambassador, Paul says, I implore you, be reconciled to God. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Did you know that? Are you living that role of the Christian life out? I hope so. So thirdly, when you reject Jesus Christ, there are consequences, the flesh takes control, and your eternal destiny is not a good one. Going back to Matthew 27, verse 22, what do they say? Matthew 27, verses 22. Or going back to, let's go back to 21 here. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, let him be crucified. Crucify him. You see, the text doesn't go on further in any of the scripture necessarily about crucifixion because the original audience, when the, when the Bible was being written in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everyone in that day knew what crucifixion was. They probably saw it walking down the road. Imagine walking down the road to Jerusalem from outside the city. They're walking on a dirt path here, right? Walking down the aisle here. There's a cross. There's a cross another guy being crucified, another guy being crucified. They knew exactly what that meant, and so the text just says, let him be crucified. Imagine that. You see, the Jews hated crucifixion because of how unclean it was, right, because of their Jewish law. And in fact, they lied, right, in the passage that Pastor Les taught to us last week. They said, we have no authority to kill. That's why we're coming to you, Pilate. They did, but their law was to stone because that was a cleaner death than crucifixion. But even so, they wanted this man, they hated him so much that they wanted him to be crucified instead. Their eternal destiny, because the Jews rejected Christ in this moment, they had separation from God, and that's still going on for 2,000 years. And Romans 11 tells us it's a partial hardening of their hearts, not forever, but for right now, God has set them aside and is working with the, gen the body of Christ, right? Which are some Jews if they're saved, but also now Gentiles, right? Which that was the, the mystery given to Paul. Are you following the crowd? Are you like maybe some of those that were in 
that scene in that crowd cheering, crucify him, crucify him, we want Barabbas. Maybe you didn't know really who Barabbas, maybe they didn't know who Barabbas was, some of those people. Maybe they had never seen a crucifixion, but they were following the crowd. Are you following the crowd? There's a story of a new missionary recruit who had gone to Venezuela for the first time for his new mission field there. He was struggling, you see, with the language and didn't understand a whole lot of what was going on. Intending to visit one of the local churches, he got lost, but eventually got back on track and found the place. Having arrived late, the church was already packed. The only pew left was the one in the front row. So as not to make a fool of himself, he decided to pick someone out of the crowd to imitate. He chose to follow the man sitting next to him on the front pew. As they sang, the man clapped his hands, so the missionary recruit clapped as well. When the man stood up to pray, the missionary recruit stood up to pray too. When the man sat down, he sat down. When the man held the cup and bread for the Lord's Supper, he, he held the cup and the bread. During the preaching, the recruit didn't understand a thing because he didn't know the language. He just sat there and tried to look just like that man in the front pew. Then he perceived that the preacher was giving announcements. People clapped, so he looked to see if the man was clapping. He was, and so the recruit clapped too. Then the preacher said some words that he didn't understand, and he saw the man next to him stand up. So naturally, he stood up too. Suddenly, a hush fell over the entire congregation. A few people gasped, even. He looked around and saw that nobody else was standing. So he finally made his own decision, and he sat back down. After the service ended, the preacher stood at the door, shaking the hands of those who were leaving. When the missionary recruit stretched out his hand to greet the preacher, the preacher said in English, I take it you don't speak Spanish. The missionary recruit replied, no, I don't. Was it obvious? Well, yes, said the preacher. I announced that the Acosta family had a newborn baby boy, and would the proud father please stand up? <laughs> you see, that gentleman, because he didn't know the language, followed the crowd, right? See, we can laugh at that very embarrassing story for that missionary, but are you following the crowd? Because you see, you may think you know what you're doing, but you have no idea. Look at the verse on the front of your bulletin. What does that verse say? It's not there for decor. Believe me, Linda can tell you, I need help with those things, okay? A man may think he knows his way, but in fact, that way leads to destruction. When you follow the crowd, whether you think you're being wise and smart in your own life, it actually can lead to destruction, like the Jews in Matthew 27. So how do we remedy that? Cling to the truth, right? We talked all about the truth last week. I know we had some difficulties um, electronically, but those who were here, you heard the message, you have no excuse. I have no excuse, I was there as well. Cling to the truth and you will not be easily persuaded like the crowd. I like 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 through 22, because this is talking about what does it mean to cling to the truth? What does that mean? Well, Paul says, but test everything, hold fast, cling to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. That's a typo there. That's one of my first ones, so that's good. Abstain in this verse means to literally be divorced, or I think actually it says to be orphaned from. When you're a kid, you're, both your parents die, you no longer can be with them, right? At least in this life. Well, that's what Paul is saying. Give up the old ways, every form of evil, and cling to the truth. Are you clinging to the truth this morning? Here's the bottom line. Are you following the crowd? Are you claiming someone's baby without even knowing it? <laughs> but are you following the crowd? What is your foundation? 
You see, Jesus gives a great parable of, is your house on the sand or is it on a stable foundation? Because you may think that you, you can walk the walk. See, believe me, I'm a preacher's kid. I'm a pastor's kid, a PK. I know exactly how to walk or talk the talk of the Christian life. And you would think, it's like the second Billy Graham over here. Wow, this guy really knows how to live his life as a Christian. But you see, if it's only in my mind and not in my heart, right, that I may hide God's word in my heart that I may not sin against him, if it's not in my heart, I'm fooling myself and everybody else, but ultimately myself and maybe my eternal destiny if I had been saved. Because you, like the Pharisees, you can, you can talk the talk, you can try to walk the walk, but that does not mean that you're saved. Whoever's been here at the church the longest, I won't try to figure out who that is, but even that person, if they did not know Jesus Christ, just because they've been here the longest doesn't mean they're, they're saved, right? Do you know that? Do you believe that? Is Christ your foundation, or are you rejecting him? And again, if you're saved, yeah, you have fire insurance, but rejecting him can look like you're in the workplace. A coworker of yours is very, very openly um, blaspheming the name of God, and you're in the cubicle next to that coworker. Are you going to sit in your office chair, your little easy chair there, and and, and tune it out, I guess, if you can't hear, because you don't want to stand up to, to that person because you love your job. You're going to get that promotion next month. You see, that is rejecting Jesus Christ in that moment because you know what they're saying. You know the truth. This may not be easy to hear. I understand. It's not easy for me to always share. I, I, like, I like having friends. I like having a nice job. I like having people that love me and admire me and care about me. But you see, those are good things. But when those things get in the way of standing up for Jesus Christ, you have an issue. And you see, Jesus says, those who deny me on earth, I will deny before the Father. You don't want to be in that place. Everyone will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, those who are saved, and will have to make an account for everything they have done, Paul says, both good and bad. How are you doing right now? What is your steering wheel? If you have the right foundation, Jesus Christ is your steering wheel, right? He's your compass in this life. But if you don't have him as your foundation, maybe it's your heart, the fleeting emotions of the heart. Is that your steering wheel? The logic of the mind that is foolishness to man? You see, the Jews were too late They ran out of time. But you, if you're rejecting Jesus Christ, you still have the time to turn to him. And scripture tells us that he always has his hand waiting for us. You know, the the beloved hymn, Come Just As You Are? Yeah, that's for unbelievers, but that's for you as well. You see, I think the more we know God's word, the more guilty we can become when when we mess up and make a mistake, right? Even pastors make mistakes. But it's okay. See, the shame that you can feel, Satan can grab hold of that shame, or he can use that, at least, to steer you further off course. But because of God's grace, right, because of his love and his grace, he's already taken care of that on the cross. You see, if you know that God is omnipresent, which just means that God is everywhere in time and in space, That means he's also in your future, not just in your present and your past, but he's in your future, and he's waiting for you to get there so that he can walk you every step of the way. Are you trusting in Jesus Christ? As the worship team comes forward for our final song, I love this song. It's simply called Knowing You 